Oh, you will. Sorry about that. Uh, we're looking at tonight uh, about uh, auditing um, reports, but I'd like to cover something that came up in the last month from my um, side in the meantime, if that's okay by uh, you guys. And that is, um, again, the Abora Cultural Impact Assessment Report. We had those comments made by um, um, Scott and they were useful. Um, certainly the idea of, of uh, just letting the reader know more about uh, what processes you've been through. So I've just been through a process exactly like that on a development site where uh, there's contaminated waste. And now, Peter, that's something you won't get up your end of the world very often, but those in the major cities are now facing that more often. The old um, ash from uh, electrical production uh, was often available really cheap as a fill material. It's quite coarse. It was uh, easy to put down, didn't have interface issues but it was full of contaminants, leads, um, uh, um, P, uh, um, uh, volatile uh, compounds, all sorts of other things. So um, whilst I'd gone through the process, I hadn't communicated that as well as I could have. And in the process, my client said, look, why don't you, if you've got a major incursion occurring, why don't you sit down and demonstrate that you complied with 3.3.4 at each point along the way? Uh, or at least you've given consideration to it, which is what the standard uh, asks you to do, to consider it. So uh, we now have a new section in my template that covers exactly that for any major incursion. We simply answer those questions in relation to each of the, um, I think there are nine or so items there. Um, and let me just pull up a report and I'll share it with you. It just shows you how we, we've dealt with that. And maybe something that, um, is useful for uh, some of you as well. Now, Peter, I believe you've got to give me control. Is that oh, right? Yeah. That is correct. Thank you. Uh, here, we'll do that. Uh, same as you do every other time. Here we go. Uh, uh, come on. It doesn't want to let me find you. I've got you. Okay. Share screen. And I'll share. Actually, I'll share this one. And pop over to it. Okay. Um, and if I go up a fraction more, that'll push that into the center, hopefully. Okay. Is that readable on most screens that we've got there? Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Good, okay. So assessment of um, the particular trees are concerned against 3.3.4 of the standards. It could be one tree, it could be 10 trees, whatever. The first one thing is location and distribution of the roots. And in most cases, I'll argue the same position. That is, it doesn't matter how you go about doing it. Um, when you're doing a root exploration, which is what the standard calls it, um, you're not mapping all the routes. You're just doing an exploration for uh, along, usually along a line, and then you'll plot or map those particular routes. So we don't know where all the routes are. We don't know what size they are. There's lots of information missing. So I make um, I make reference to that. Um, I think it's it's um, somewhat strange that a, a route um, exploration process for trees and development site, but when it comes to a transplant, I don't do one at all. I just simply say, this is a standard uh, distances and that's where we're gonna cut. The tree's in good health and off we go. So, um, so location of the roots is one. Potential loss of root mass becomes even more problematic. And that is if you don't know where the roots are and, and you don't know how um, big the roots are, then you really don't know what portion of the root mass you, you're losing. I think you can assume you're going to lose roots if you're going to have root severance uh, or excavation within the, um, the um, root zone um, of, the, of the tree. I don't think there's any other alternative, but how much uh, is going to be removed is really difficult to calculate. And I'll show you with a, an Excel spreadsheet a little later on. Um, why that's problematic. Have I showed you the spreadsheet before, Peter, the elementary one? 
I don't think so. I don't okay. recall. It'll be it'll be informative for you. So um, anyhow, so in most cases, I argue that I can't be precise, but I can work out what percentage of the uh, indicative um, tree protection zone. The indicative tree protection zone, if you remember, is the 12 times trunk diameter. And um, what we actually end up protecting is the tree protection zone. Um, so it's odd that we don't always call it the indicative tree protection zone because otherwise it's confusing. Um, but here, you know, I've got one that's 40%. That's a fair big percentage of, of um, roots that are lost. If I talk about the Australian standard though, or the ITPZ, um, a standard transplant at five times trunk diameter is going to be removing about 82% of those roots. Um, now I'm not saying that transplanting isn't damaging to trees. Uh, and I, I'm always of the view that the best transplant is one that you never do. Um, but, you know, if we can move a tree and damage 82% of the, or have an 82% encroachment, then um, realistically a 40% encroachment may not be as bad. Um, and in most cases, not like to be. So that's potential root mass loss. Uh, next one's the tree species tolerance to root disturbance. And most trees that we deal with are reasonably tolerant. And, and I was looking for a shot last time round, and I now can find it. Um, and that's a shot of uh, Georgia and um, transplanting there. Uh, I think I did show you one last block round, but I will show you a second one from the series if I can. Um, and I think you still see my screen here now. So if I go to my photos, Hopefully, if it's nice, I'll be able to go geo, uh, GIA, Georgia. Uh, no, G. Uh, it's really slugging. G E O, Mark. Yeah, I typed it, but it's um, for whatever reason, the system is causing my system to lag. So I'm, I'm uh, waiting for the, I've hit delete. And, um, okay, GE, hit the AE. So I don't know why, what's happening there, but it's really causing the system lag. Let me try just reloading the page. No, there's something there that's happening uh, that's causing it to lag. Let me um, close down what I can. See if we can get that to. Uh, speed up. Uh, let me try this. That's window now. No, I'm getting no response. To my keyboard. Okay. Close down some of these then. Um, Let's see how we go now. No. Is your keyboard connected properly? Is it battery operated? It is battery operated, so it may need just a battery change. And I can do that straight away, so I will, just as a cautionary. Was to, I can type in the upper section, so it seems odd that I can't type in the, mm -hmm. um, the lower toolbar there. But we'll see whether that makes any difference. It may have just been no, it's no. just. Uh, just try again. Uh, sorry, guys. 
um, uh, got to end this call. Okay, I'm getting my right to come up, bud. <clears throat> um, yeah, now we're getting there. Okay. This is a... Um, screenshot from a uh, recent doco movie. And again, you can see this euclid has been transplanted. Um, and you can see the size of the trunk. To give you some um, idea of the size of the trunk, though, um, it might be worthwhile having a look at this one here. There's a man in the background. Um, these are the size of the eucalypts. One, two, three, four, five, um, plus the one you saw, six of them moved. Um, so, you know, we often think of eucalypts as being very sensitive to root damage, but you know, here's a gentleman who's managed to uh, demonstrate almost the converse view, and that is they're not so um, sensitive to root damage. Um, and I think that's worthwhile keeping in mind. So, you know, what, what species um, are tolerant? Well, I think I've discussed this um, in part before, and that's those that are in Riparian zones, those that grow in um, shallow, um, um, low moisture soils, sandstone um, species, um, those trees that um, are rainforest species, they all tend to move or, or tolerate uh, fairly heavy root damage. Um, age, vigour and um, size of the tree, and it's interesting, we've talked about this in our tips, um, um, videos. Uh, vigor, vitality and health are three different things. Um, vigor is the genetic propensity. And so, you know, a fig's vigorous. Um, maybe maples uh, are not so vigorous. Um, lean and stability of the tree, oh, that's fairly easy to deal with, except uh, again to address the fact that manic structural root zone is not, is not a um, an equation that says the tree will fail. In fact, you can go a lot closer than the structural root zone and not have a tree fail. And I'm pretty sure I've showed you photographs um, of that last time around um, with um, a camp for laurels at Grafton, for example. The soil characteristics, again, that's usually not going to be something that's going to have a, a big difference. Uh, past structures and obstacles are, are something that you need to consider if there is something that either is inhibiting root growth in, in some direction or if that you've got a situation where that's um, advantageous. So for example, you're, you're moving, removing an old footing and putting a new footing back in. And then design factors are the things that, you know, design changes or uh, work methods that are being altered. So um, just putting those in and, and letting the reader know that you've gone through that process and you've given thought to those is something that I think adds weight when you're doing a major recursion. And hopefully, um, from the last three or four blocks, um, you've got a little bit more confidence about having a major incursion. Now, major incursions shouldn't be something that are feared. Major incursions should be something that um, you see as a part of what an arborist is. And in, in fact, um, I've often made the comment, and Peter will uh, testify to this, that um, the standard almost makes clear that if you can't deal with a major incursion, you're probably not worth paying, because that's realistically the only time you need a... a um, and a Boral Cultural Impact Assessment Report is if you're having a major incursion. You do actually need one for a minor incursion, but it's a pretty bland document. Um, put up the fence here, finished, and we're all done. It's a minor incursion. Um, so realistic, the role of an arborist is dealing with a major incursion. Not that you want to be doing that all the time, but um, as real estate gets more expensive, we're going to be dealing with it more. And, and London is a great example, and those of you who have seen Jeremy Burrell um, talk about um, the subject of uh, protecting trees and development sites. And when you start doing things like putting um, um, basements underneath buildings and basements underneath basements, um, you know, you have a, a huge potential impact on trees. Um, so we're seeing more and more of that, that sort of thing happening. Um, we're seeing more and more infill development in our cities. Um, I grew up in a time where a quarter acre block was considered to be normal. Uh, now, a quarter acre block is considered to be a subdivision site. Um, uh, Peter, I think you're much the same in that. that yeah, that's frame. right. Yeah. Yeah. So there, it's just a thought um, for you to take away. It was something that was suggested by a client, and I thought, yep, 
they're absolutely right. I, you know, I'd gone through the process. I just hadn't articulated that process. And if we go back to the very beginning of war, we remember we said the purpose of the report is to communicate. And, um, you know, the communicating that, yes, I've gone through the thought, I'm not just coming to that, um, that point uh, meaninglessly. Um, you will notice that um, there's discussion here about uh, my view on um, uh, um, route mapping in terms of pressure. Uh, generally, we want to try and keep our spray rigs, um, if we're using water or hydrovac systems, we want to keep our pressure so that the contact pressure at the route is less than 120 psi. At 120 psi, we start to cause cell damage. Uh, and that's worked on the reverse of the turgid pressure. So McLeod and Cram, for example, and I think you've got that in now in your, your documents, give us a, a turgid pressure of about um, 800 to 900 kilopascals. That's, you know, for rough round sakes, about a megapascal. Um, 900 um, kilopascals, getting close to about 130, 140 psi. So it gives you that sort of range. 800 is less than... 120 psi. So somewhere around about that 120 psi, you end up um, causing damage. And unfortunately, both air, air spades or the air excavation equipment and water excavation equipment, um, when we need to get very close to the roots to break the soil particle apart, in other words, when we're not got very frangible roots, um, uh, sorry, frangible soils, uh, those. Um, those conditions damage roots when you're getting the, the tip of your your uh, your lance or your wand um, close. So, um, you know, the ideal root mapping is probably still um, um, once the soils start to get cohesive. So clays, for example, um, in most cases, it's going to go back to hand digging and that's a horrible process. Um, uh, Oh, and you're young, David, you're young. Um, have either of you gone out and done hand dug root mapping at all? Uh, oh, and you got your mic off. And David, um, you're... Mark, mic. I recently um, did some uh, root investigation, root mapping using ground penetrating radar, and that worked pretty well in, in that we found some roots and it satisfied council. Yeah, look, ground penetrating radar does have some advantages. Um, it is the only non-destructive method, but also has a whole pot of secondary complications that often create issues on a development site. The first being that when you're um, finding roots, you don't know what the tree belongs to. So if you've got more than one tree in the area, that can be problematic. Mm, yeah. um, you can get false <clears throat> negatives and... Um, did you watch the process happening, Peter? Yeah. Yeah, what you get is just a, a graph, like a resistor graph, a, a, you know, a plot, a little set of beeps. And so it's not like you might think with um, the typical NCIS that you all of a sudden get this 3D image of a skeleton underneath ground. Now you get this hard spot, soft spot, and it picks up as a soft spot. And so... Yes, and it's important to have the, um, the uh, operator interpret that data because... And, and draw the roots on uh, on a plan or on the ground or something for you because it's uh, it's not possible to um, look at that the data that they produce and make sense of it unless you've got some experience. Yeah, and, and you can get um, false positives fairly readily. So um, all you have to do, uh, particularly when you get um, lots of herbic soils and by herbic soils, uh, I think we've defined it before, uh, uh, soils typically in urban areas where there's buried things um, mm -hmm. from urbanization, they can often give um, a, a whole pile of um, uh, false positives. So that's more problematic. There, uh, I have been reading Peter that there have been some innovations and changes uh, coming through in, in some of that technology and uh, now they're um, they're talking about ground penetrating X-ray as well, um, but how uh, useful or reliable that is, I don't know. And what sort of um, secondary issues associated with that will be interesting to see. Um, but yes, yeah, so Owen, you, you've been out and done some uh, root exploration. 
Yeah, I've done lots of it over the years, manually. <laughs> manually, yeah. Have you, have yeah. you tried some with the Hydrovac or with the... Um, <clears throat> yeah, and I've, I've done it um, with Hydrovacs and with air, air spades and, and, and dry vacuum as well. Um, I was surprised to see how much damage the air, the, the dry vac and an air spade actually did. Um, just how how it, particularly on a on a tallow one, one is <clears throat> we were doing some excavation next to some tallow woods, um, and the air spade just blew the bark straight off the roots. Yeah, look, and at that point in time, you might as well have just cut the roots, in my view. Yeah, yeah. Sweet, but it's, you, you know, you've two thirds ring barked, usually by the time you realize you've ring barked. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, look, it's air, even though your compressor is running at 120 psi, which is within the limits, the, the way it works is using physics, it's putting a lot of air through a very small nozzle and, and confining it down. And as it does that, the speed and the pressure increases. Um, uh, as a result, so you end up with this heavy point load of, uh, of uh, fairly heavy pressure. And yeah, we found the same thing. We ended up um, um, tearing off the, the bark frequently when we used it. We've got one. Um, it didn't give me the results I wanted, um, particularly once I got into heavier soils. As you say, if you're on really nice, friable soils like um, a sandy loam, um, it's, it's a lot more effective. And Peter, some of your cratinazone clays may um, perform. Yeah, well. it, it's it's um, not as bad as puggy soils or very heavy, but um, yeah, it's still, and it depends on uh, whether it's wet or dry as well. And it's a real art to get that pressure right because you don't want to be running your lens bang smack up against the, the, the soil cut that you're doing. Um, and so, you know, there's this, this desire to want to push up higher. David, you, you've had some experience? Um, yeah, look, I've, I've seen an air spade in operation. I haven't actually used one, but um, yeah, done a fair bit of hand digging. I had a job on Mount Buller uh, just prior to the snow season, starting on a, um, on a snow gum, and uh, they, they were claiming it was impacting some um, water pipes, which it was. But um, yeah, on a... On a steep hill um, with snow around and uh, digging by hand, I, I was a bit worn out by the end of the day. So an, an air spade or, or something um, better than that would be, uh, would be uh, a lot easier, I'd imagine. But as you're saying, it, um, the damage that it can cause, it's, a, it's that fine line, isn't it? Yeah, and it is. Uh, uh, I find it hard to get the pressures right. So I'm, I'm suspecting that uh, I'm not the only one in that that situation and I suspect that uh, as I said I, it, in most cases I can do a better job by hand with a spade um, provided I'm not digging in really horrible heavy soils um, the puggy clays Peter of your Lismore low areas or the um, Cumberland clays of, of Sydney uh, tend to be pretty horrible um, and I've often used a, a hori hori knife does everyone know what a hori hori knife is yeah I have, yep um, let me just pull you up and I'll show you a picture of a hori hori knife. Um, a hori hori knife is, is good um, if you're just going down to about 150 mils. Uh, so driveway crossovers and that sort of things. Um, I'll often use one. I just plunge it in all the way along. K-N-I-F-E. So, you know, it's sometimes called a soil knife. Um, as it opens up the page. So that's that's a, there, yeah, too fast. That's the sort of device there. So just plunging that in um, all the way along on a, a thing that I find a really quick process if I'm only going down about 150 mils or so. Um, I guess you could do the same thing with the spade, but um, you know, it, it, you just got a lot more surface area. So I get down on my hands and knees and um, do a crossover that way um, or a driveway. Pretty tedious if you've got to map 20 or 30 metres of it, I guess. But um, if it's just a short crossover, I can do a, a um, crossover in about, I guess, 
15 minutes with one and then uh, just expose any roots that are of concern. So that's something that might be useful. It's something that, uh, as Peter knows, I, I keep in my kit all, at all times. It's useful for all sorts of things. Um, the really nice ones come from uh, the US, but at the moment, uh, everything from the US is horrendously expensive. Um, Japan makes some really nice ones as well, um, a little bit more sharp, but the plastic hand ones, in my view, tend to uh, be more durable. Um, so the, one of the issues with root mapping um, or this, this process of uh, root exploration is to do with the, um, the relationship of roots. And um, I will just quickly, uh, if I can, Excel, E, X, C, E, L. An analometric equation is simply uh, an equation that gives the relationship of things. And the one I find easiest is, those of you who know, Madam Tom's had a heart transplant, a lovely guy. Uh, Adam had to have a heart from somebody between six foot six and six foot eight. Adam six seven, I think, is is correct. One might be wrong. It's but it's in that sort of order. So why? Because you need a pump of that size to run the circulatory system in a body that size, um, because there's that many meters of of blood vessels in in Adam, and he's got more than I've got. Um, you know, and and I've got a tiny wife, so maybe uh, Adam's stolen some of hers, but. Um, we've got this relationship between one part and others. So that's allometry. Um, and so this is uh, Triton Hornbeck's equation and it's, it's worthwhile looking at it. So for example, if we've got a tree with a, a diameter of uh, 60 centimeters and let's see if I can find a different Excel spreadsheet file. Um, And I can't do it quickly, so I have a reverse calculator. Oh, yeah, I should be on this one. Where are we? Um, it's covered. We can't see it. Standard Triton Hombeck. I should be able to find a reverse Triton Hombeck. No, it doesn't make any difference. So a 60 centimeter diameter tree has. Um, 26, uh, 2.6 tons of material. Um, and if we were talking about root size, we could say the same sort of thing. What, what, what sort of mass might be associated with a 10 centimeter root? Well, it'll be lighter than this because roots are not as dense as, um, as above ground material. Do you want me to, I can't make that any bigger. I guess I can. Can I? No, I can't make that any bigger. Um, I guess, no. no, Excel doesn't allow me to make it any bigger for you to view, unfortunately. But if we talked about a 10 centimeter diameter root, um, it would weigh 32.4 um, kilograms or the proportionate equivalent given that root material is lighter. And we know that there's about 25% root mass generally to tree mass. So um, if we sh ignore the the mass difference between roots above ground and below ground that actually goes against our position if we're um, if we're looking at the the difference between the two. So it's a more conservative view um, by the fact that the roots are less dense. But if I'm talking about 32 um, kilograms, now let's go back to our 60. I trunk 60 centimeters. If we said, well, a quarter, then a quarter of 2,600 is about 650 kilograms. All of a sudden, our 10 centimeter diameter root is really not that much, it's quite a small proportion of 600 kilograms. It's 1 20th, it's 5%. Um, does that make sense? I can't make a link available to. Um, uh, Triton Hornbeck for you, if you'd like. It's a, a standard equation. So it just lets you see that. Uh, and now when you go down to a one centimetre root, how much difference do you think that's going to be? A one centimetre diameter root, now we can do. And there it is, it's 0.1 of a kilogram. So if we had 600 kilograms, that's one twelve hundredth. Cutting a centimetre diameter root doesn't do a lot at all, does it? 
Hmm. You wouldn't expect it to either. No, no, you wouldn't expect it to. But you know, I regularly see things like, for example, don't cut that root. It's got a if it's if you come across a root, you can't cut it. If it's greater than, I think of a local council in Sydney, um, five centimeters. Well, that's six kilograms. That's one hundredth of the mass of the root system. So you know, all of a sudden that becomes critical because I'm going to cut one hundredth of the root mass to the tree. That just seems to be um, crazy. So um, it, it's something to think about. Um, that again, the smaller the root gets, the smaller the mass gets, and it's not just uh, a linear equation. It's actually a complex um, um, parabolic equation. So you're getting a significant drop as you get smaller and smaller. And, and it does make sense, Peter, um, absolutely. But it's, it's just being able to see it numerically that makes a big difference. So, um, you know, when in the earlier days, we used to say, oh, don't cut roots greater than two centimetres in diameter. Well, you know, um, again, it's, there's no difference between two centimetres and one centimetres in real terms. Um, they're a pretty small amount of, of mass. So um, that whole process in a supporting paper is what I'll be presenting at uh, Arbos next year. Um, so we'll give you all, all the, the background papers and support behind it. But it's um, when we started to play with it, we thought, wow, you know, um, it does make a, a lot. And when you start getting about uh, uh, bigger trunk diameters and the impact becomes even smaller. So we start talking about a tree with a, a metre diameter trunk. Um, you know, you're talking about 26 tonnes. Oh, sorry, that's not a metre. Uh, that's 10 metre diameter trunk. That's better. No, no, sorry, 100. Then you're getting nine tons of material. So the impact of cutting a hundred mil root on a, um, uh, a tree with a, a trunk with a metre diameter is way less than the impact of cutting a hundred mil diameter root on a, a 500 mil diameter tree, for example. So again, it's, it's seeing that difference. So realistically, uh, how we approach bigger trees um, is that we can in fact cut larger roots, I'm not saying you should, but it may not be a, a big problem. And um, I guess the first time I really saw it, um, Peter, was um, um, a guy called Don Black came over and taught tree protection. And I did that in 1987, 1988, came back with a few others and we went over to Manly and I took photographs of some Araucarias that had sheep piling um, just 50 centimetres away from the trunk of the trees. And these Araucarias are still there to this day. Um, and I was positive at that point in time. I knew now, I was educated. I knew those trees were going to die from the sheep piling. And of course, um, they sit here and mock me today saying, uh, well, didn't get that one right. Um, and so again, that's in fairness, uh, Araucarias at Manly are on some very sandy soils. Um, so they've got lots of sinker roots and, um, you know, the, the number of roots cut was not significant in terms of the tree. The tree was able to deal with that. Um, so dealing with root tolerance, I think, does need some consideration of the size of the roots. And um, in my view, that's probably the only reason to, to go out and do the exploration work. But I hate it. It's dirty. It's um, unsatisfying. It's frustrating. Um, and for those of you who have been through the process, it's then open to that wonderful thing called the liver quiver. Um, Vicky, do you know what a liver quiver is? It's that wonderful gut feeling you get. It says, yep, that will or won't work. And um, unfortunately, when you put a, a report and you say, yes, look, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that um, cutting through a 100 mil root will be the end of this tree. You're doing it on a liver quiver and the consent authority is doing much the same thing. They're coming back to you and saying, uh, no, um, it's not going to work. Um, and they're not doing it on any scientific um, process. They're just saying, hey, um, that's what we think. Well, I could have done that before we did all the root mapping. Before I did the root mapping, I thought that it was going to be successful because you know, it's not as bad as transplanting. And before I did the root mapping, the, the consent authority was almost certain they were going to say no. They just wanted me to do it so they could say no. And all of a sudden I find a 60 mil or a 100 mil diameter root and the answer is no. 
Well, you know, I think we could have avoided all of that um, by getting uh, out of that situation in the first place, which is a part of the reason why I hate this process of root exploration is that it is, um, if the consent authority wants to say no, they'll say no. And, you know, finding a two centimetre root or a five centimetre root is not uncommon for a, a medium sized tree. Um, so, um, but when you look at those transplants, maybe it's not so critical after all. So that's that's uh, the end of the stuff for um, tree protection on development sites and writing the arboreal cultural impact assessment reports. I'm sure we'll come back to it again in time. But the next question is dealing with an audit report. Um, and our, um, our unit, we actually do have a unit now that addresses uh, some of this in a little bit more detail. Um, document and audit tree work. And we talked about um, how we go through that first stage of documenting. How do we um, how do we specify pruning? And I, I asked you guys to have a look at the standard. Sorry, you guys and girls, I'll try and be as inclusive as I can, but it didn't mean to be um, sexist. I'm getting into trouble nowadays for lack of sensitivity. Um, but uh, who here had a, a go at trying to figure out what the standard actually says in terms of um, uh, pruning. Anyone? No one bold? Okay, great. Let me pull up for you then a, um, a copy of the standard. And we'll have a quick, quick look at it. Um, I guess the first thing we need to do is define what we're intending to do. So, um, for example, is pollarding acceptable under the Australian standard? What do you think? Reduction pruning? So if, if I said prune to the Australian standards um, and Owen, you came back and gave me a tree that was two thirds the size, um, would you have been compliant with the Australian standard? Possibly. <laughs> well, yeah, but provided you made the cuts in the correct spot. I mean, so yeah. that, yeah, yeah. So th that's why I say that the, the comment that standards, none of our standards are specifications. All of them give us a process, all of us give information, but they don't give us this, this precision of language um, that we need in a set of specifications. Um, yeah, pollarding, pollarding's in there too. Yeah, pollarding's in there as well. Uh, interesting, there's some mention of root pruning there as well, uh, although it doesn't go into it. And for the sake of it, root pruning never needs to go back to a node. Um, just wherever you need to cut is as short as you want to make it, unless you want to put something like a barrier in or, or do some deflecting, but... Um, Apart from that, it doesn't need it. And having said that, um, if you've got two metres of root that doesn't fork, and I can think of a, a photograph that I've got that shows this, um, they're putting in a slab, there's no branching at that point, cutting that two metres of root off back behind the slab isn't going to affect the tree either because that um, two metre long woody root is not absorbing water. Well, it's not absorbing a lot of water. Let me clarify that. Um, Root hairs take up most of the water. Um, there are aquaporins elsewhere in the, which is the membrane protein that water is transported through. Um, there are some aquaporins elsewhere, but that's usually only when the soil is getting close to saturated. So, you know, when your soil moisture levels are running 70 or 80%, you may see um, a little higher uptake of, um, of water through some of the uh, woodier roots, but it'll only be a very small percentage overall. So, um, you have to excuse my slowness in finding documents. They are filed systematically. It's just that there's so much crap in our server system now that's ridiculous. Um, standards.
is 4373-2007. I can make this larger so you can all see it. Uh, if you don't know, there is a copy of uh, AS4970. Someone has illegally posted, I don't know who it is, online. Um, I often um, advise my um, my clients to go grab a copy and read it. It's worthwhile again um, for them to have some idea of um, of what's involved in in the standard and let them see that you know we're not trying to be unreasonable um, pig-headed rat bags and we're actually um, being sensible about things. Um, always worries me when I see um, a committee that looks like this. It's uh, the EVO18 committee and um, just a number of borocultural organisations that are represented there uh, is really lean versus a whole pile of other organisations. Um, but at least there's a, a, a moderate borocultural representation in the uh, committee. And, you know, the document I think is a great document and it's um, served our industry. Well, I've just got to go down one fraction so I can get the edge of it there. Okay, you should be able to all read that now. So the, the purpose is, is um, close these down too. Just telling me there's a fillable form there. Okay. The purpose is not to, uh, to look at how you should or must prune everywhere, but certain, certainly in terms of uh, um, most um, suburban areas, this is what would apply. And the procedures in the standard are guided by theories of branch attachment and compartmentalization of decaying trees. Lopping, topping and flush cutting are unacceptable practices. Well, um, in most situations, and we come up with uh, rest, uh, restoration pruning and of course, um, very recently, um, some of our environmental pruning, which uh, encourages some of those processes. And so there will be a need to tweak this standard to reference uh, some of those changes. Um, and for the sake of it, making sure that we're clear, uh, lopping is, or topping is non-nodal cutting. Um, and uh, again, depending on the tree, that may be catastrophic or it may be just something that's of minor inconvenience. Um, so application for use by arborists, tree workers, government departments, building contractors and others with contractual arrangements. Um, got a whole pile of definitions. Um, most of those are, are fairly good. There's a couple, again, that'll need tweaking just as we've um, learnt more. Um, extruded bark, um, don't know where that came from except the dictionary um, that uh, IACA produces. Um, so it's an unusual use of the word, but um, it, they're meaning it's not bark, it's, it, bark's not included, so it's just normal bark or excluded rather than included. Um, lines tailing is horrible practice. Flush cutting we've almost got rid of. These are major changes in the last 30 years. So if you want to see something that um, the professional associations have done, this is one of those things. Um, we cleaned through our company archives about um, eight years ago. And in there, I found a 1994 consent form from Parramatta Council, one of the better councils in Sydney for tree protection, showing a tree with uh, an image with the top one third of the, the height of the tree cut off, flat topped. Um, so, you know, that's from 1993, 94. Um, that's, that's not that long ago. So we have seen lots of, of um, improvements. So the first thing it says, consideration before printing prior to being prescribed or undertaken. Um, there's some things that we should do. Um, then talks about equipment, disinfection. Um, does everyone know how to disinfect? Um, I, I know, Peter, at the end of every day, you go back and disinfect all your saws. Is that right? I don't um, drive a saw anymore, Mark. And, and saw, no, I don't. And, and it's... It's one of those interesting things. We talk about it, but it doesn't happen. But there's no, only if there's a particular disease um, concern. 
That's right. And probably the, the most common ones, ceridium on uh, cypress hedges that we, we see uh, done for. But it's one of those things that we should be a little bit more uh, attentive to. Um, the, the, there are a number of things. There's um, some um, chemicals that are now sold for, for this phytosanitary process. Um, but still, I think the easiest and the best is 70% alcohol, 30% water. Where do you get 70% alcohol? Well, ethanol would be great, but you're not going to go out and buy pure ethanol. So buy methylated spirits um, and add water, 30% water, dilute it down. The reason you dilute it down amongst anything else is that um, it's volatile. So you reduce its volatility. You can set fire to 70% um, methylated spirits, but doesn't uh, go boom like it does when you've got a pure alcohol. Um, and the other advantage of it is it dries fairly quickly, which means um, you don't end up with rusting of your, your stores like if you're using a bleach type. Um, so um, phenol or um, um, based uh, disinfectants is the other option. Um, and there are a couple of those that have been designed for the purpose of um, of disinfecting equipment. Um, but alcohol and water is probably the most convenient and most cost effective and it does the job very well. Um, our, our three cut system has, has changed. There's all sorts of debates and arguments about that depending on what part of the world you come from. Um, so that's another one of those changes that we'll, we'll see coming through. Um, if you're old Owen, uh, like you're getting close to, uh, <laughs> undercut top cut further out um now some of what we're getting is undercut top cut further in um and so uh, again there's arguments for and against both of those and some of it does depend on what you want to do um so you know we need to think about all these things in the tree Um, stem branch, branch ridge, um, I'm going to argue, doesn't exist. I think that's an anatomical misnomer. I think what it is is this is a branch um, that, for whatever reason, has become equally dominant, but it's still a branch. Um, theoretically, a co-dominant stem cannot produce a branch bark ridge because none forms. Um, so I know that's being pedantic, but again, it's one of those things that we're, we've learned and we've come on. Uh, who here is old enough to have an original copy of the body language of trees? Anyone? Oh yeah, I've got one. You got one, Peter? Yeah, okay. I've I've got two if someone wants one. I picked one up the other day for about $180 second hand. Um, but um, the um, the difference between Maddox stuff in the body language of trees and then his new uh, text, uh, the Encyclopedia of the Body Language of Trees. And by the way, if you're thinking about buying a book, buy that long before you buy the earlier Body Language of Trees. There are heaps of changes in that text. Um, and those changes have, have come about in part as, as we've learnt more about trees and as our profession has become more tree friendly. Remember, Maddock himself is not a, an arborist. Uh, he's a physicist, um, so uh, very clever man, very talented, great communicator. But again, um, he's learned in the process of things as well. So um, I think we're all in that process of learning. It's easy to to pick on people and you know get into trouble for doing it occasionally, but I don't, I don't mean to. I'm just saying we need to get things right. Um, so that's one of those things that I see changes. So we've got some pruning classes. Uh, boy. I have never seen the printing classes ever mentioned in a set of specifications. I wonder what that is. Um, but we've got these things and we've got these codes that somehow or other were intended to be used and were never used. And I don't know that they need to be used, um, but we've, we've got these things. The, the first of these uh, things is crown maintenance. And so it's great. We're going to do some crown maintenance. Um, if that's what we're going to do, um, should we be specifying that or should we specifying what sort of crown maintenance? So deadwooding, um, um, Peter will know, I have a, a real issue with uh, the, the term deadwooding. Um, 
uh, sorry, I just noticed that we had a couple of comments in the chat, so I'll quickly address those. Susan, um, <laughs> hand digging removes too many absorbing roots. Um, if you're talking about the, the fine non-woody roots, uh, air knives destroy them just in no time, they desiccate. Um, and water um, is just got no chance, doesn't matter what you're doing. All that you're doing when you're doing a root investigation and you're uh, trenching is you're exposing woody roots. And the loss of a few trillion fine root hairs is not anything that's sort of an issue to most trees. Um, sounds like it should be, um, but um, it's not because that woody root can continue through. In fact, if you really wanted to have some fun, you could have a woody root um, go through the air, you could excavate and have it go through, avoid and be like that for the rest of its life. That happens when you get trees that are eroded around. Uh, it's exactly what happens. So, um, and yes, councils do make you do it. And um, I've taken very recently to being somewhat insubordinate and saying, if you can't tell me how you're going to interpret the data using a non-subjective system, in other words, if you can't give me some form of, of um, um, published process of dealing with it, um, then I'm not prepared to do the exploration um, because it's subjected to simply ad hoc guesswork and we can do that now without having to do the root investigation. Um, if they're prepared to look at something like um, um, an allometric equation to do with it, then I'm happy to go through that process. Um, ultimately, yes, I still end up getting forced to do it. I just fight back as much as I can beforehand. Um, I'm maybe not unlike others. Um, I've got so much work on, I don't want to be busy doing this sort of crap and uh, spending a day doing a job that eventually ends up with the city saying, look, um, yep, you found, and I did one not so long ago, I've got the builder. I get builders to do it for me wherever I can. I had a builder um, expose a 65 centimeter root on a 750 mil diameter jacaranda. And I said, well, that's fine to cut. And the city came back and said, oh no, that's, we're not gonna accept that. And my client said, but it's like two or 3% of the root system. What on earth is that the no for? And I said, and that's why we didn't want to do it in the first place. It's, you know, it's just mindlessness. So hopefully that answers that for your system. Sorry about not seeing that earlier. Okay. So dead wooding. My only concern about the use of the, dead, the word dead wooding is it infers that we're removing dead wood uh, rather than dead branches. And I just really wish we'd picked a better jargon or a bit of, sl a bit of better slang in our uh, language. I get in trouble, for example, when I'm teaching anatomy of calling my, um, my two uh, lady assistants, Danielle and uh, Catherine, of calling them the girls. Now, they don't mind. I've asked them. I've checked. But apparently, that's not a, a phrase you can use anymore. I should be calling them the ladies or the team is even better. Well, dead wording sort of fits into that sort of category. Um, it, you know, dead branch removal, as much as it takes an extra couple of words, um, it adds clarity. And remember, the purpose of writing these things is to add clarity. Crown, crown thinning is the next one. Um, and that's a practice that we're seeing um, really starting to die out. I don't know whether um, that's coming through at grassroots end of the world. Perhaps those that are doing um, um, pruning work on a regular basis may share with me on that. But uh, crown thinning is something that... Um, has really started to lose popularity and in part because of work by Ed Gilman looking at um, the fact that um, it doesn't buy a lot of significant reduction in loading um, and it um, it's the tree readjusts and, and puts back on the canopy in much the same way um, without um, too much change to the tree. I don't think it's, it should be thrown out altogether. I don't think it's something that should be ignored, but um, got to be careful. The other issue with crown thinning is it often results in um, the easiest branches being cut and the easiest branches are always those that are closest to the, the trunk or normally always closest to the trunk. So you end up with getting some pretty... Um, um, close to lines tailing, if not lines tailing. And I think, you know, 
Um, you want to see a good example of that, and it's not a criticism of those that have done the work uh, or those that are specified, but Hyde Park, if you look at the figs along the main avenue in Hyde Park in Sydney, you know, if you wanted to do a reduction cut, there's almost nothing. There's just three metres of outer canopy. Whereas um, had the work been done appropriately, you would allow light to get back in. And if you'd like, I by the next um, time around, just let me know either on the chat or by saying yay. Um, good, good reduction printing work can be undertaken for decades. And um, there's a great jacaranda being done by a guy called Gary Claxton at his house in New Zealand. He's an arborist and it's been reduced for over 20 years and it's probably grown maybe 150, 200 mils higher in that time. It's just about opening up, letting light come in, letting lower branches come up, reducing them back down, repeating it. Stanford has done the same thing at um, its campus in California uh, with Patosh Manjulatum of all things. Um, the, the trees uh, grow up, they uh, open them up, um, do some reduction pruning. Um, the new section come back in, they keep on working it back down. So. Um, I don't think that crown thinning is without value. I think um, we've just got to be careful with how it's done. Selective pruning just simply means figuring out which things need to be there. And formative pruning, um, you know, may, maybe formative pruning should be in its own uh, category because I don't think that really is a part of crown maintenance, but um, it, it's there nonetheless. So um, are we doing crown maintenance? I guess is the first question you want to really ask for your, your um, work or are we doing crown modification? Um, and it's interesting that crown thinning is not modification of the crown, um, but reduction pruning is modification of the crown. And, and in reality, uh, they're both much the same. And Jeremy Burrow gave a, a talk um, at, at a Arbos conference a few years ago and talked about reduction pruning. Um, and the kickback was amazing. The number of people that sort of said, ah, we're talking about lopping, you know, and this is horrible work and this is, um, and that's because that was generally our thought. The reduction printing has really gained some, um, some popularity in terms of research, um, a, a small amount of reduction, you know, a reduction of 10% um, of, of a stem or a limb, um, can give significant reduction in load. Um, so if we're thinning to uh, reduce the likelihood of parts failing, reduction printing definitely is superior in that, that situation. Crown lifting, well, yep, there are times when we certainly need clearance, stuff over paths, roads. Um, my pet hate is crown lifting over buildings. And um, can I get a nod from those that have got their video showing um, um, that's something that, that often I'll hear somebody say, I want, I want the tree pruned up because it's overhanging my, my building and I want the amount of overhang reduced. Um, has everyone heard of that at some stage or other? Yeah. In, in fact, there actually is a code that talks about it. It's the bushfire code. I've just been dealing with it only in the last week again. Hate it with a vengeance. Um, it's a code that says should, um, not shall. That is, um, um, canopy should not overhang the building. And of course, every bushfire consultant and every councillor are spineless. Um, did I say that? That's horrible. Um, are mostly spineless. Um, and so we end up with this, this view of you can't have branches overhang. Of course, um, I met with one on Friday and um, very informative. She said to me, well, the reason why we don't allow branches to overhang is they can burn through and, um, you know, you end up with uh, branches falling on the roof and going through, puncturing the roof, and you get fire inside the house. And I thought, boy, um, I've never seen that happen quickly with a eucalyptus, as slowly it can, particularly their cavities. And then I thought, I've never seen that ever happen on a metal roof. So I thought, yeah, maybe we should be thinking about how that how we put into that uh, code um, at some stage or other. And maybe again, when you see that list at the front, that you saw this one, there should be some stuff from uh, consulting arborists um, in that. But uh, I'm, I'm fairly convinced that uh, lifting or cutting canopy from over the roof doesn't stop fire from going under the roof because that's about 
flame and flame is blown in part by wind. So it's about wind direction. So just overhanging branches aren't a big issue. Um, and I'm almost 100% convinced that you could dig a hole in the middle of somewhere 200, 500 metres away from, uh, from trees and end up with leaves in it. Does anyone uh, feel otherwise? So, you know, um, roofs unfortunately have gutters. Gutters are, are systems that are, are actually holes. They're long, continuous trenches and they're made to fill up with leaves. That's what they're built for. Um, the Australian standard says there should be a, uh, an overflow if there's any chance of it backflowing into the eaves, which there almost always is, because most gutters are higher at the front than the back, or at least close enough to the same height. Um, and if you try and buy those spouts or spigots, you'll notice that no one manufactures them in Australia. So I'm figuring that most gutters must be incorrectly installed somehow or other. Um, so that's, that's crown lifting. It's got its purpose for uh, clearances, but um, beyond that, I think we really should um, be cautious in how we, we do that. Um, one of the reasons why is you don't want things to lift and end up um, the bottom half becoming more rigid and the top half becoming more flexible. Um, it's a problem when we prune regardless, but it's worse. Pollarding, what can't you pollard? Anyone? Trees that don't produce adventitious shoots. Trees that don't produce adventitious shoots. That's a great answer, Peter. Um, you can't produce them once. Um, nearly all, all trees produce a whole pile of latent buds or uh, auxiliary buds that don't come out. And they'll stay um, active for a few years and then slowly decline. Um, so something like our, our um, latent greens fit into that category. But yeah, I think that's a, a, a great answer. So theoretically, you could pull out a eucalypt, and I've seen some eucalypt pollards overseas, and um, they're not bad. Um, not saying that I'd want to do that as a standard process, um, but again, I think <coughs> we need to be careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, remedial pruning um, or restorative pruning is the thing that gives me the confidence about that earlier statement and about why we probably shouldn't throw lopping out necessarily. Um, and, I, and I pose this question and um, Vicky, I'll get you to turn your mic on because you're, you're a lady and you understand this better than, oh, sorry. You're another person, you understand this a lot better than somebody with Asperger's like me. I, I get confused, but I think this is case. If I planted a tree on my wedding day, which I did, and it got damaged in a storm, do you think my wife would expect me to do whatever possible? We're still together and we still love each other. We're still good friends. Do you think my wife would expect me to do everything possible to bring that tree back into good condition? Of course. And if it lost all of its branches at the outside ends, every branch got broken off, typical microburst damage, she'd expect me to rebuild it. That's right. So, Owen, can you do that pruning work for me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so it's interesting. We all know we can rebuild a tree that's been lopped, um, but we're all afraid of the lopping process. Um, and, and yet nature does it for us and we're happy to do it. And I'm pretty sure, Owen, you do remember 1991, 21st of January, big storm, and the number of trees that were smashed, lost all their branches, that were never pruned, that were never fixed up. And the regrowing has been amazing. We saw some of those damaged in the microburst of about three years ago. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm constantly amazed. I'll every now and again go out and see this tree and think, oh, that's 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 the 1991 damage that's regrown. It sorted itself out and it didn't even get an arborist to come and touch it. Um, so I think that's, that's uh, one of those things that we need to consider is that there may be times when when lopping is appropriate, and that might be, um, you know, for example, better to lop the tree than to lose it altogether. Um, and I'll share an example of that. That's not perfect, but it will will help you understand. And then I'll give you a quick set of specs that I'm I'm using for some basic pruning, and we'll look at more specifications next time around. We're we're pretty close to an hour now. Um, so photos, 
somewhere there by date. Um, where are we? I had it, I had the wrong one by date. Photos, photo sets from others. And this is a really great example of what can be done in terms of reduction pruning. Um, it could be done as a reduction print on this because we're talking about a tilia cordata. Um, Peter, that's an unusual tree for you, a linden or a lime tree. Um, but um, the person that owns it's an anthropologist and uh, archaeologist, one of those sort of people. Um, and there's a, a building behind that he does want to see, the trees in the corner of his property. Um, and so, fair enough, he doesn't want to see things um, get, be exposed. Canopy gives fairly good screening. There's an arborist up in there getting ready to do some pruning work. We'll have a look at what he does. Um, but he's going to do a reduction prune. And the reason why is this little pit here. There's a pit right up near the tree, and Sydney Water says the tree's got to be cut down. My client says, Mark, you're an idiot. You'll figure out some way, but please, can I keep my tree? I said, yep. We can figure out a way. So that's our tree. That's it after pruning. So I'm not going to say it's the prettiest reduction, but it still basically covers the building at the back, um, still gives some screening. But here's the, the horrible bit. Um, we now need to expose this pit. Can you see the opening to the lid there, Owen? Yeah, okay. How are we going to do that? Well, I could only figure out one way, and that's to make a cavity. And the easiest way to make a cavity is with a stump grinder. So, indeed, that's what they've done. There's the screening for it. It's, you know, it's an effective tree. Um, and I can give you some updated shots of that, but that was in, um, I think, um, properties about nine years ago. Uh, six, six years ago. So six years ago, we um, we did that. I went back and looked at it last year during the COVID uh, um, things. I had a tree nearby to do so. I knocked on the door and said, could I look at it? And I uh, got in there and I kicked the decay section out. The, the, uh, uh, a true hollow, a true cavity had developed. Walls um, one, two, and three had declined. Tree four, wall four. Um, was uh, in, in surviving. Um, the client was a little concerned then. They said, is the tree going to fall over? I said, no, because um, we've got a trunk down low that's now a lot bigger than it ever needed to be. So, um, you know, could you do that with a, a eucalyptus? My answer is absolutely. I showed you a guy who'd moved a massive big tree with a big cavity in it. And it's one of the things that Peter and I know uh, we've talked about before, and that is in Asia, for example, um, people value these things we call defects. Mm -hmm. We dislike them. They think a tree is more valuable because it's got a fault or it's got a hollow or it's got a defect. Um, we've developed this sort of very much Heidelberg School of Art response in reverse. Um, for those of you who don't know it, prior to the Heidelberg School of Art, there were seldom dead branches ever drawn on or painted on a tree because that's not the way God wanted them to be. Well, it's like we're as arborists want to do the same thing. We want to make a tree so it's perfect rather than saying, look, this tree's got a cavity. Isn't that wonderful? Um, and I know when it comes to tree risk assessments in schools, you know, if it's in a, an area where there's going to be moderate to high use, we'll say there's a cavity. Uh, and then that's usually the end of it. Um, it's a cavity in most cases. It's not a, um, the end of the world. And in fact, it's interesting in storms, um, cavities often don't fail, other parts fail. So cavities are not necessarily much weaker than any other part. And I know I've uh, covered that in, in um, the tips videos, Peter, I think it was the first or the second one. So if you haven't seen it and you want to see, we discuss, for example, how white stem rot or uh, felinus stem rot um, can often make the stem stronger, not weaker. I recall um, David Evans, who was training his valid risk assessment method, making the point that when you're looking at a 
ca uh, trunk cavity, it's important to look at the wood that's there, not look at the wood that's not there because it's the wood that's there that's holding it up. So if there's sufficient wood to hold it up, it doesn't matter what shape it's in. Well, it, it, except that it, it can, the shape and where the wood is located can make the, um, the tree stronger. Um, and I will illustrate it seeing as we've talked about it, but go find the, the tips discussion and you'll see that um, we have um, discussed to some uh, extent. Um, and I know I, I took a better shot of the uh, sample very recently for a talk in Darwin. Uh, yep, there it is. So if you haven't seen this one before, it's um, discovered, uh, discussed in tips, but the tree is, is round, except we've lost a whole pile of stuff here from decay. And as a result, the tree has put more wood further out. If we took all that decayed material out and brought all the wood in, we'd still have more wood there than we need. So we've got more wood and it's further out. Well, more wood makes it stronger, not weaker, and further out makes it stronger. So this is a an instance where um, the flyness is, is acting as a, as a weak pathogen. It's actually making the tree um, stronger, not weaker. And you think about it, that does make some intuitive sense that the flyness has developed mechanisms to interact with the tree so that the flyness doesn't die either. Because what happens if the tree dies? You know, the flyness gets to come in and take a bit of that. At the moment, it's got exclusive territory. It doesn't want failure to occur. It's happy having 100% of its own little turf rather than having to share it with everything. So there's certainly um, advantages uh, to that. And those of you who haven't seen Limbody's work on, on it, um, there's a reasonable probability that Philinus in this situation starts as a endophyte. That is, it's already present in the living parts of the, the, the tree or at least the apoplast of the tree whilst the tree is living before injury. So it's internal. It's not something that's coming from the outside in. So again, um, it supports this process that there's probably um, a mutualistic relationship of some description between the two. So, okay, some quick specifications, because um, I said I would, and then we'll go into a little bit more detail in the next um, group round. Um, sorry, as I went through trying to find out where things are quickly. Auto inserts, I think I mentioned before, I use a lot of stuff that just lets me find things quickly. So can, if I go F and say friction, find it. There we are. So some printing specifications. Um, works performed by an arborist with a certificate three or a diploma in a boriculture. So I'm, I'm an elitist and I apologize for those who are upset you know, I want I want some qualifications. Should be a capital C there for certificate, by the way. I think is if I'm correct, Peter. Um, yep. All final cuts are, are made as illustrated in the standard. So, the, the, you know, it's a very simple thing to require. The, the, the cuts are illustrated. It doesn't matter whether it's a reduction cut or a pruning cut. Um, by the way, they're both pruning cuts, but anyhow. Um, <laughs> The vinyl cuts shown in the standard are good. They're, they're based on good sound research. We've probably got a little bit more tweak to do on our reduction cuts um, and our pruning cuts. We need to understand whether it's a co-dominant stem or a branch. Um, eucalypts produce lots of co-dominant stems, very few branches um, for whatever reason that is. Um, whereas Tilia, for example, that we just looked at lots of branches, which is why it's really easy to reduce. Um, so it should be giving us some hints there. Um, Reduction cuts are not made unless so determined by the arborist. Okay, well, you can have whatever you want there. A friction saver or a rope, um, a single rope technique is used for any rope access in the tree. I'm old enough to remember and three strand ropes. Uh, Peter, did you get three strand ropes? Yes, I've used three yeah. stranded ropes. They were saws, so they would cut through the bark every time. Then we went to braided rope. And braided rope's good, except if you're over about 55 kilos, in which case they act as a saw, actually act as a file. It's not so cutting. It doesn't cut as quick, but 
certainly um, damages the bark. So um, if you're using a double rope technique, I want a friction saver in single rope technique. I'm happy with that being uh, uh, not, but anytime you're running a rope through a fork, uh, I want some form of uh, protection. And again, any rigging will require, uh, required will run through a pulley or a friction saver and climbing spikes are not used. So that's essentially um, the basics. Uh, that's simply saying printing in accordance with the Australian standard. But I haven't said what sort of printing, except that here you might need to do some reduction printing. It might be canopy lift. In this particular case, it was, uh, I wrote it for a reduction printing back from a building um, on a heritage tree. And the city had said, no, we're not going to allow printing. And a part of the reason they didn't want to allow printing is they were not confident that the printing that was going to be undertaken was going to be appropriate. Now, if you live in a big city like Sydney, there is a council, and I won't mention its name, but it's a big city, um, and they require you to draw every cut that's going to be made. Yeah, right. um, and boy, is that a hard process. Why? Um, because trees are three-dimensional objects. And photographs are two-dimensional items. And it doesn't matter what you do, um, it's a very hard process. So um, very difficult um, dealing with how or specifying that in a way that cannot be misunderstood. Um, and I certainly have been the, the victim of that. I went out the other day, um, looked at a... Um, um, a site where I've got to determine how much is going to be cut. That's the far one I was talking about. And, you know, it's really hard to say, look, you know, it's sort of roughly this portion of the canopy um, and do that. I've taken a photograph up through the canopy, but it, it's not got it precision on it. I guess the perfect way to do it, and maybe one of you will come up with it, is to have a laser device that sort of um, prints an angle or prints a line across the, the tree. Um, I suspect that when you do come up with that, you'll need to be extremely careful um, because um, we get them in aircraft uh, pilot's eyes. That's a, um, an offence under law, um, but I'm sure that uh, there's got to be some technique like that that we can uh, eventually use, but very difficult specifying um, pruning, unless you're talking about just one or two branches. If you're talking about pruning a lot of branches, you know, you, you could have dozens of photographs and have it quite confusing. So um, trying to specify with words has its advantages. Any questions on tonight before we say goodbye? Again, hopefully there's uh, some interesting thoughts or words there that you can add. Um, if you've got some feedback on it, if you think, boy, this could be improved, um, please share it back to Peter and he'll make sure it comes back to the group. Uh, I think it's important that, uh, again, any way we can improve our communication. Now, I do have a, a far more detailed set of specifications um, that I'll share with you next time round, but this will cover the basics for you um, in almost all situations. You know, if, if printing was done that way, uh, in general, um, we wouldn't have an issue. The, the things that we haven't discussed there are things like what pr proportion of the canopy um, so again, depending on your consent authority, there may be a, a general e exclusion for 10% or up to 10%. There may be a general exclusion for size. And again, I know that we've got people from um, throughout uh, areas apart from Sydney. Um, but, you know, we have, for example, Leichhardt Council that allows you to do some things for some size branches and not, not other things for other size branches. Um, I think that's now called Inner West. I don't know. I lose. It is Inner West now, Vicky? Yeah, Inner West. Um, so again, um, and then we get silly situations where we've got a, a, a local government area where there could be two or three old DCPs that still haven't been harmonised. Um, and so uh, just trying to get the basics down there. Um, you'll notice in the second rendition of it, there's two copies of it. The second rendition, um, I define the standard in case in the document I'm inserting in, I haven't already referred to the standard. If I've already referred to the standard, then I can just simply use the top one in case you're wondering why those two copies. And it is certificate three written III in Roman numerals. Um, 
in accordance to the training package. So, uh, okay, well, if that's it, guys, I'll see you next time around. Look at um, printing specifications in a bit more detail. Um, and hopefully um, we can then go on to how you audit printing work. Um, and at some stage or other, that's something that you'll all be asked to do um, or that you'll do at least for your own sake. Um, but it is useful to, to uh, be able to do that in written form. And I'll give you the hint now, uh, really critical when you're auditing to try not to ever make it personal. Um, and I'm an expert at making it personal. Um, so I have got lots of people with dartboards up in their houses and somebody got a tattoo on the back of a bullseye. Um, but it's, it's trying to do that in a way that um, preserves people's dignity and lets them feel like they're important and valuable. That's a hard process when you're saying you've done something wrong. And to give you the, the goodbye story on that, uh, I said to you the following year, after we did the first talk on tree protection, I had a, a gentleman come over. Well, that gentleman one day said to me, Mark, we need to have a talk. We're in, um, he was in Carlton and he'd been doing some training. Uh, Arborist by the name of Dick Proudfoot, wonderful man. And Dick said, we need to have a talk. And he sat down and for the next 30 minutes, he tore shreds off me. Um, and I can tell you as a grown man, probably about 40 odd years of age, bursting in tears and crying for uh, an hour or so, it's pretty difficult. Um, but the one thing that I have to say is when he was critiquing me, I knew that it was done out of the right spot, that it was being done out of love um, and that he really wanted to make a change. Um, and it was a really um, important moment in my life in terms of having another adult say, hey, you know, this crap's got to stop. So things like, um, and, and, and so, you know, arriving on time, Peter, which is why, I get bad when I, I don't get started on time, why I like to start class in time. I'm providing value for money, making sure that if I promise something, I do it. Um, somebody shared with me the other day and I'm still reeling from it. They said, oh yeah, I, I, consulting, I only charge X, Y, Z an hour, which is not a lot, but on every job, I usually add a couple of extra hours on more than what I've done. And I thought, my, I could not do that. Um, that just is not where I sit. Um, Mine's the opposite. I'll do three hours worth of work and build two and a half because I think, yeah, well, you know, I wasn't overly productive in that two and a half hours, uh, in that three hours, so I better make it two and a half. Um, so again, yes, it had a, a significant impact. So if we're going to critique um, stuff, we've got to make sure that what we're doing is having the right impact, not the wrong impact. So I'll see you guys in a month's time or um, three weeks' time if we're coming to tips. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Peter.